this meeting to order and may I welcome you to the 16th meeting of the Public Petitions Committee in 2017. Can I remind members and others in the room to switch phones and other devices to silent. Agenda item one. Um, the first item on the agenda today is a decision on taking business in private at a future meeting. This would be for the consideration of our work programme and to consider a note by the clerk on the general data protection regulations. Our members agree to consider these items in private at a future meeting. Thank you. We can then move on to agenda item two, <coughs> consideration of new petitions. Our second agenda item is the consideration of new petitions. As members will recall, the committee agreed at its meeting last week to defer consideration of six out of eight new petitions to today's meeting. The first new petition for consideration today is petition 1659 by Bill Tate. The petition is calling on the Scottish Parliament to urge the Scottish Government to create an independent body with a remit to make findings of fact and complaints involving local authorities. Members have a copy of the petition and a spice briefing. The petition background information outlines concerns relating to the manner in which different councils handle similar issues, which the petitioner has suggested may result in a lack of, lack of equity in the treatment of the Scottish people. The petitioner also comments that the current routes to making council complaints do not have the teeth to set in motion action to bring parity and justice to council complaints across Scotland. And I wonder if members have any comments or suggestions for action. Angus? Okay, thanks, um, convener. <clears throat> you have to excuse me. I think I've uh, come down with the, 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 the lurgy or something. Um, I'm, I'm sure we've uh, all been con contacted um, by constituents who have frustrations with regard to the way our, our local authorities operate, and a satisfactory route to address these issues isn't always uh, via the, the ombudsman. Um, so I think the petitioner actually reflects the views of quite a number of people who have contacted me in the past um, with regard to um, local authority complaints, uh, and I would certainly be keen to see this petition move forward. Anyone else? Rona? I agree with that. I think this is someone challenging the status quo, um, and you know it, it would definitely be worth taking it forward to see um, what the opinion of the government and um, various stakeholders were on this. Um, I think it's a really interesting petition, and I think we should we should take it forward to see how how we can progress it. Okay, yeah. Brian. Yeah, I think I think there's. Many of my constituents would be very interested <laughs> in this petition. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think so too. I think really looking at what happens with outcomes, because they do tend to narrow it down. So I would mm. really like to take this forward. I think there's an interesting argument about an independent body against democratic accountability and a democratic accountability at a local level, mm. So, which inevitably will mean that different places are different. And also the fact that you know, sometimes people's degree of satisfaction with a decision is the extent to which the decision is one that they wanted. We're all, that's entirely natural, but I suppose what would be interesting would be to identify what the fundamental principles are around fairness in terms of the treatment of, of complaints. Yeah. I don't think you necessarily need an identical process. I wouldn't like to see it set in stone, but I think there is a, a bit like common law. There needs to be a degree of consistency needs to be tested against what other people are doing if you're not happy. And I think the proposal here is about doing that, really, mm -hmm. rather than nailing it to an absolute that everybody must do exactly the same thing. But there does need to be a sort of a check and balance, really. Mm -hmm. The ombudsman process can very often be frustrating for people because they only really look at how the complaint has been handled rather than maybe fundamental underlying issues. But So I think we're talking about right to the Scottish Government... Um, you said other stakeholders, Rona. Who would you yeah, suggest? Um, we, we could we could ask um, COSLA. I think we we, we definitely need to be uh, consulted. Um, Quality Human Rights Commission, um, citizens, citizens' advice. Mm -hmm. um, anyone that anyone that might be you know have a an interest in it, I would think. I don't know whether there's a specific advocacy support unit as well. They may have a view as well, because they often get involved in supporting it. And also, mm -hmm. I guess, inside local government itself, around the officials who are managing the process and how they deal with mm -hmm. complaints. Mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. be useful. I don't know who the appropriate... 
representative body would be. But I think that um, well, obviously COSLA, but I'm just thinking about officials. It wouldn't be education ones, but you know what I mean? There's a kind of a body that represents not quite chief executives, but what could happen to deal with complaints? Ombudsman, although I, I mm -hmm. guess that might be fairly predictable, but we should consult them as well when we're talking about about them, basically. Yeah. Yes. Um, I think it's Solace, um, the chief executive yeah. body. Be just interested because they're having to manage <coughs> complaints and you know actually the administrative process. Okay, if that's agreed, there's a number of issues there that we can take forward, and clearly the, the committee regards this as an interesting area for us to explore. If we can move on then to the next two petitions, um, petition 1660 by Bill Tate and petition 1661 by Melanie Collins. Both petitions raise similar issues relating to the current system for complaints about legal services in Scotland. Members have a copy of the petitions and the respective SPICE briefings. Petition 1660 is calling the Scottish Parliament to urge the Scottish Government to review the operation of the Scottish Legal Complaints Commission to make the process of legal complaints more transparent and independent. Petition 1661 is calling the Scottish Parliament to urge the Scottish Government to reform and amend the regulations of complaints about the legal profession in Scotland, which is currently delegated to the Scottish Legal Complaints Commission, by creating a new independent regulator of legal services with powers equivalent to the Solicitor's Regulation Authority, Legal Ombudsman, Bar Standards Board and Solicitor's Disciplinary Tribunal, which serve consumers and clients of legal service providers in England and Wales. I wonder if members have any comments or suggestions for action on this petition. Michelle? Can I check? I mean, obviously, the, there is a review underway um, that was launched in April of this year, but not due to report to the end of next year. Um, and I, it seems to me that's an awful long time. So that's my sort of first comment. Um, I am concerned about the, the sort of Turkey's voting for Christmas arrangement that that is there in terms of that oversight. Um, and I do think that, that there perhaps does need to be some, some clear water between lawyers and those people who are reviewing them. Um, it does feel a bit close for comfort. But I do think we should check in with where the review is going, what it's looking at, you know, because if, if the review is already launched, do we need to be doing something parallel alongside it? Okay. Um, thanks, convener. I, I think both these petitions are um, extremely timely. Um, both Bill Tate and Melanie Collins highlight serious issues with regard to legal and um, with regard to legal uh, the, the legal profession and and the way that uh, the SLCC operates uh, with regard to complaints. Uh, I would agree with M Melanie Collins that there's a, a strong argument in favour of creating a new independent regulator of legal services, and I agree with Bill Tate's call to make the process of legal complaints uh, more transparent and independent. And in recent years, we've also seen a degree of conflict between the SLCC and the Law Society over the operation of the complaint system, uh, and I'm sure I wasn't the only MSP to, to receive representation from the Law Society earlier this year. Uh, stating their frustration and disappointment uh, in the increase in the SLCC levy uh, to be paid by solicitors, and also stated the complaint system was slow, complex, cumbersome, and expensive. So there's no doubt in my mind that this is the right time for this to be looked at. Um, as uh, Michelle Ballantyne's mentioned, the Scottish Government has acknowledged that uh, uh, the current process for people wishing to make complaints about their solicitor are too slow and, and too complex. Um, so I was certainly pleased to see the Scottish Government launch their independent review of the regulation. However, I would take on board uh, Michelle's, Michelle Ballantyne's point that um, the fact that it's not due to report back until the end of 2018 does seem to be quite a lengthy period. Um, so, yeah, I, I mean, clearly we can contact the Government for clarification. But I think, given the, the similarity of, of these two petitions, um, there's a strong argument to join them together uh, to help them move forward. Okay. Are we agreeing, first of all, that we should join them together? Because it does seem to me that they're, they're amplifying the same issues. Yeah. Yeah. OK. <coughs> Brian? Was, did, was, did the Law Society not call for a change? Mm. And then well, that was rebuffed? 
Mm -hmm. Is that am I correct in that? Right? I'm, I'm not entirely sure, but they it certainly weren't the happy. Levy. It was to do with the levy, and they weren't happy with with some of the yeah. um, the operation of the SLCC. But they haven't, as far as I'm aware, formally called for a change. I, I thought they were investigating this very point, and it was rebuffed at some point. I might be wrong. I don't. It would be worth, I think, um, just getting clear in our own heads where all of that is, and we can obviously ask. Um, for that information, um, it would be, so we want to write the Scottish Government about the timescale for their review and its remit, um, and I think to write to the relevant stakeholder bodies to ask what their issues are. I mean, it doesn't feel like a very long time since this legislation was passed, so it would be a natural time to be looking and reflecting on whether it's, um, it is effective and what the alternatives would be. My sense was at the time. When this went through the Parliament, we wrestled with what all the different options were. It wasn't something that just went through without any debate. So it would be looking at um, how people feel that that has... Is it a bedding in issue or is it an actual structural problem with it? Um, and do we need to... And actually, as the petitioner would suggest, we have to revisit this and, and get a different kind of regulatory body. OK, so um, I think we've agreed then, as I said, to write to Scottish Government the Complaints Commission, the Law Society, the Faculty of Advocates, um, Citizens Advice, I think was mentioned, and Scotch Solicitors Discipline Tribunal, any others? I wonder, convener, if it would be worth contacting the Judicial Complaints Reviewer, um, although he or she would deal with judicial complaints, uh, as is in the title, but um, it would be good, I think, to, to get, the, get the view or the JCR as well, um, just okay. to, if, if, they, if, they, if they have one, they don't, they don't, they're not compelled to, yeah, to reply, but it'd uh, be good to hear their views if they have one. Okay, okay that's agreed then. Um, we'll deal with both those petitions in that way. If we can now move on, <coughs> the next petition for consideration is petition 1663 by Leslie Wallace. The petition is calling the Scottish Parliament to urge the Scottish Government to sponsor a comprehensive and independent study into the full economic impacts of driven grouse shooting. Members have a copy of the petition and a spice briefing. The petition background information explains that there is a need for a study of the true economic value of grouse shooting, which takes into account the latest research regarding grouse moor management and new factors such as the role of potential natural flood alleviation work in the uplands and fully developed ecotourism initiatives. I wonder if members have any comments or suggestions for action. Angus? Yes, uh, thanks, Convener. I should declare uh, that Les Wallace is a constituent of mine and I've had uh, brief discussions with him about, uh, about this petition and uh, the, the overall issue. Um, it raises a number of uh, valid environmental concerns and uh, the petitioner has clearly done some extensive research of his own uh, and rightly highlights that there is no impartial study of the true economic value of grouse shooting. Um, however, we do know that the Scottish Government has announced that it is commissioning research into the costs and benefits of large shooting estates to Scotland's economy and Scotland's biodiversity. So it may be that uh, uh, that work will address the petitioner's concerns. Um, but. In the meantime, I think we should uh, uh, certainly write to the Scottish Government uh, and ask them for uh, an update on where they are with the uh, with their own research, uh, and then look at, look at the response. I, I thought that um, <clears throat> part of that we'd be to ask them for the time scale for the mm. research because I think you know they, I think we've established they're doing it, but we've not got a, big, a start date and a finish date. It's difficult to. Um, because according to the briefing, it, it was called for, no. but there's no, no evidence that actually it's been... It says, um, it Rosanna Cunningham announced extra measures to protect Scotland's birds of prey. These measures include the Scottish Government will, quote, commission research into costs and benefits of large shooting estates to Scotland's e economy and biodiversity. Yeah, it said commission research, but but it then says no further details are available at the research at the time yeah. of writing. Yeah. So we don't actually know whether it's been commissioned yeah. or... No. So I think that's so, the first thing to So we, we, we were wanting mm. to then, um, establish whether they've acted on their own commitment round, right? mm -hmm. commissioning research and what the time scale for that yeah. would be. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. I mean, there seems to be a few petitions uh, colliding here all around the management of, uh, of, of grouse shooting estates. We heard 
and one on, on mountain hares. There's the raptors. There's, there's quite a few flying through, yeah. and it all seems to be around this management of, um, or, or, or that this idea that uh, it's a self-managed process at the moment. Um, or the tension between these large estates yeah. and, I suppose, environmental and um, protection of wildlife concerns. Mm. Yeah. I thought it was quite interesting last time thinking that the mountain here is thriving <coughs> because of, of I know. Oh, grouse. Which is yeah. We also found, also have subsequent to that, had a wee look at it, and we found that it's actually other environmental issues that is driving the, the, the mountain here population down outside of. Mm. You know, the, 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 the planting of the spruce conifers is driving, you know, ferret, uh, ferret weasel fox population, which is decimating. Mm -hmm. It's quite, it, it's, it's quite a tension. I wonder whether it would be useful to bring all of them together and, and have a, a day when we looked at them, because there's something about the unintended consequences and the impact of each one on, e on each other, which is what you're referring to, I think, mm -hmm. Brian. So it would, it, I think it would be useful to bring them together to look at rather than looking at each one in isolation. Can I suggest mm -hmm. that we deal with this petition mm -hmm. over and, and we, we do establish whether the research yeah, has well been commissioned, mm -hmm. we write to SNH um, for their view, and we know that the Raptors petition has now gone off to the, I call it the Rural Affairs Committee, but it's something much grander these days. Um, mm -hmm. So, that we, But there is an interesting thing we can maybe ask Clarts to pull together would be the number of petitions that have really tried to address this tension about the management of the land um, and the protection of the environment at the same time. Is there anything else we want to do in this petition? No? Nope. Okay. Um, I think perhaps we should ask SNH for their views yep. as well sure. on the petition. Okay. Great. Okay. Thanks very much for that. If we can now move on to the next new petition for consideration is petition 1665 by Mark McCabe. The petition is calling the Scottish Parliament to abolish the common law crimes of blasphemy, heresy and profanity to the extent that they remain law. Members have a copy of the petition and a spice briefing. The committee has received one written submission in relation to the petition from the Humanist Society of Scotland. The petition background information explains that blasphemy and blasphemous libel were abolished in England and Wales by the Criminal Justice and Immigration Act 2008, Section 79, and raises concerns that a similar change has not been made in Scotland. And I wonder if members have any comments or suggestions for action. I feel it. <laughs> I feel it's, it is outdated and it doesn't sit well now with, with our modern laws. That's my position. Oh, I, I agree with that. It doesn't. It seems to serve no purpose at all. So, um, you know, the, the only concern is that there's, there's there's so much legislation and that there's so much happening that maybe it's it, you know it's it's not it's not urgent. But okay. I, I, I definitely think there's merit in in, in um, abolishing it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> looking for a profane, looking for a profane or blasphemous oh, yeah. response. <laughs> I, I, I take silence as uh, a sin. I, I mean, I think that it may be that this is the kind of thing government might consider doing, but they're not going to make it a priority. So it'd be worthwhile, I think, yeah. contacting them, um, asking Scottish Government for its views in the petition. And I don't know if, any, if there are any other... I mean, we've got, obviously, Humanist Scotland's response, but whether we, there are any other people we would seek to get information from, I can't particularly think who that might be. I think if we get the, the government's response at the moment, as I say, I, I, I can't see that it would be made a priority, but mm -hmm. there's no harm in taking it forward and asking for the government's views on it. Mm -hmm. And how that fits with um, religious freedom and the right to express religious views and so on, because mm -hmm. that's the kind of religious hatred. Is a, um, it's been, we have some things that the Parliament has discussed in the past. But there are other... There are other laws on the statute books that cope with yeah. the difficulties that might arise yeah. um, or, or the objections that might come forward. So, Okay, mm. in that case, we're agreed that we write to the Scottish Government um, and ask their views, not just on the legislation, but if they were to do something about it, is, is, do they have any time scale in, in mind? Okay, if we can then move on to Petition 1666 
on the Scottish Parliament electoral cycle. The next petition for consideration today is Petition 1666 by Ian Davidson. The petition is calling on the Scottish Parliament to urge the Scottish Government to prepare legislation revoking the terms of the Scottish Elections Dates Act 2016. Members have a copy of the petition and a spice briefing. The petition background information explains that four yearly electoral cycles should be reinstated for both the Scottish Parliamentary and Scottish Local Government elections. In other words, for the next Scottish Parliament elections to take place in 2020 and the next Scottish Local Government elections to take place in 2021. <coughs> the background information explains that the original purpose of the legislation, which sought to avoid clashing with the Westminster General Election five-year cycle, is no longer valid. I wonder if members have any comments or suggestions for action. Anyway, through the discussions that are going to come forward at, at the end of this year, and I'm not entirely clear what would be the benefit at this stage of doing this. I thought it was quite interesting in that when the Parliament was established, it was a four-year cycle. We've mm -hmm. had at least one five-year, we're having another one. Mm -hmm. Will the Scottish Parliament vote against, you know, I mean, there's almost a self-interest in the Scottish Parliament's point of view in saying... Um, We'll just leave it the way it is. But actually, the purpose of extending it to five years was to avoid clash, and that doesn't um, apply any longer. So I think it's quite. A, there's an underlying argument here which is quite strong, mm -hmm. but I'm not sure, um, having made that decision, whether the, the the government or the parliament would revoke that. Well, as it's pointed out, that the government can use secondary legislation to do it, but yeah. they've got no plans to do so. Mm. I mean, um, we, we, we could write to the government just to, to get further clarification, but um, I, I think they've kind of made their position clear on it. Mm -hmm. But, you know, if we want to, rather than close it down, if mm -hmm. we want to move it on, we could ask them just to clarify the, their position again. I thought it exposed quite an interesting anomaly that we had established with fixed ten parliaments, which we've happily changed. I know, um, that's And true. for, for no, good reason, but you, you there's know... There's no think, consistency, no. Yeah. Uh -huh. And yeah. I think that's part of the problem with trying to decide in advance what you're going to do in in, in the political environment that doesn't necessarily conform to, to expectation. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, but if we were to decide we should extend it to six years or whatever, people would clearly say that was was not acceptable. You might get backlash. You can <laughs> yeah. see the rationale for yeah. it, mm -hmm. but whether it is worthwhile at least, I think, maybe asking the Scottish Government to reflect so. yeah. in the petition as well. I think so, yeah. yeah. Good behaviour. <laughs> <laughs> that was where all this good behaviour is coming from. Yeah. Um, okay, so we're agreeing to write the Scottish Government yeah. seeking its view in the petition um, and further information about when it intends to launch its consultation in electoral law um, and whether it would include consideration of the date of the next Scottish Parliament general election as part of that consultation. Um, and if that's agreed, we can then move on to. <coughs> Um, our penultimate new petition of the day is by W. Hunter Watson and calls for a review of mental, a review of mental health and incapacity legislation. Mr. Watson's petition calls on the Parliament to urge the Scottish Government to carry out a wide review of mental health and incapacity legislation and in doing so to take account of recent developments in international human rights law. Mr. Watson has particular concern about the administration of medication and other treatments in a covert fashion or otherwise without consent. With reference to changes in human rights law, Mr. Watson considers that, quote, if legislation were enacted which took full account of recent relevant developments in the field of human rights, then it's likely it would follow that doctors could no longer prescribe that unwanted drugs be concealed in the food or drink of care home residents, Care home residents could no longer be given potentially harmful drugs as chemical restraint. Mental health patients could no longer be held down and injected with psychiatric drugs against their will, nor could they continue to be given ECT even though they resist or object to that treatment. Non-consensual treatment would be kept to an absolute minimum. You should also note a further submission from Mr Barry Gale, which is additional to submissions um, in the Clark's report and it's been circulated this morning. I wonder if members have any comments or suggestions for action we may wish to take on this petition. Michelle? I have some real concerns about the Mental Health Care and Treatment Order, Scotland Act 2003, and its implementation. Um, I would very much welcome a review into it. I think the Millen principles on which underpin it have um, not always been adhered to 
Um, there are guidelines on how it should be enacted. We've seen a rise in the use of care and treatment orders, and I think really, you know, we, it's something that does need reviewing urgently. So I very much support this petition, and I think it, it needs to go forward. Okay. I mean, I, I think this is a you know it's a huge issue. It, it's it's very complex and and it and it affects so many people. Um, I mean, I agree with what Michelle says, but always remembering that the clinicians and the the, the medical staff do a the carers do a very difficult job, and you know the last thing we want to do is make their job more difficult. But I think it's definitely worth um, you know ex exploring and take, taking forward and and getting the views of of. Um, of all, of all people involved, and I think it, it's just a huge, huge petition. Yeah, um, I've got to just add, I think it throws up, you know, uh, uh, issues that, that have been underlying for a little while uh, around the Mental Health Act, and again, I agree, I think that this petition uh, is well worth pursuing uh, mm -hmm. and, and to give us a chance to investigate. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Okay, thanks, <coughs> Convener. Uh, there's no doubt the petitioner presents a, a well-argued case yeah. uh, in the uh, in the papers, um, and you know that has certainly convinced me that uh, uh, we need to take this further. Yes, I mean I think the um, the, the petitioner and the, the submissions, including the one from Mr. Gale, do highlight what the concerns and issues are, and you know the anxiety I think that there is that we're um, the care set is under phenomenal pressure and managing difficult circumstances. They don't have resources. This is kind of where they end up. And I think there are, so that, you know, where people are well-intentioned but de dealing with difficult circumstances, then outlining the principles that are, um, should be involved, I think, is really useful. So if we were agreeing, then th this is a serious petition, an important one. Um, we'd be agreeing to write to the Scottish Government. Who else? Mental Welfare Commission. Scottish Human Rights yes. Commission. Yeah. I wonder whether, in light of your comments, Rona, about the pressure on carers and and staff, would it, would it be worth you know maybe having a view? I think we need to have a view the, the from them. Professional organisations most directly affected, and maybe the unions who most directly affected. Yeah. That would be the health union. Would it? One wonder. Um, what might be worthwhile is to ask the clerk to look at what would be the relevant organisations and then we can agree that mm -hmm. later. But mm -hmm. the general principle that we want to try and get a sense of mm -hmm. to the extent to which this is a problem and an issue, mm -hmm. not just in terms of um, and paramount and paramount interest in the rights of the patient, but what are the circumstances in which these challenges arise? Yeah, um, I, think, I think so. So that's agreed. We're obviously recognise the importance of this petition um, and we will uh, contact the bodies as have been identified. Okay. If we can now move on to the final new petition for consideration today, which is petition 1659 on the proposal to for an independent vaccine safety commission by Bill Welsh. Members have a copy of the petition and a spice briefing. The petition is calling for the Scottish Parliament to urge the Scottish Government to establish an independent vaccine safety commission. The background information explains that the petitioner is of the view that there is evidence that the presence of solid contaminants in human vaccines have been linked to autoimmune disease and leukaemia. The petitioner has provided supplementary information in relation to the petition, which is available on the petition webpage, including the routine immunisation schedule published by Public Health England and Scottish Schools Annual Pupil Census information published by the Scottish Government. The petitioner has provided feedback and the accompanying SPICE briefing calling for the responsibility for vaccine safety to be clarified. Members may wish to be aware that the briefing has therefore been updated since our papers were circulated to clarify that there is no single body responsible for the safety of vaccines. In addition to the JCVI, which was originally referenced in the briefing, details of the role of the Medicines and Healthcare Products Regulatory Agency and the European Medicines Agency have also been added. And I wonder if members have any comments or suggestions for action. It's quite, quite a relevant one for me because uh, I've recently had a constituent, in fact, this week, come in and uh, explain um, she's of the opinion that two of her three sons 
um, have contracted neural issues around the MMR vaccine. Um, and I, I, I'm currently what I've done is written to the government to ask if there's, if, if there's any research being done into uh, the link between the MMR vaccine and the neural condition. So, to me, this is something that's quite timely. Uh, I definitely think I would. Um, I think we should be writing to the government to at least at least have their views uh, on this petition. Anyone else? I was struck by the fact that the JCVI, which was obviously created as a committee, but it doesn't have any real statutory footing. Um, and I suppose there's a, there's a question mark about how, where advice is coming from and whether or not somebody like JCVI should, should get some recognition, whether it's been assessed as suitable to be recognised. Um, and I, so the, there was something, I mean, it's an awfully complicated subject. I mean, it's a really complicated subject um, in terms of vaccinations because they're not tested in the same way as drugs before approval. Um, and I think that, um, the, I mean, there's a lot of conversation about it generally across the board at the moment in terms of the safety of vaccinations and the processes by which vaccinations are tested and the process by which they come onto the market. Um, so I think this sits in amongst a, a big subject that's already taking place so I definitely think we should not ignore it I definitely think it needs taking forward but I wonder how we sit it in the bigger conversation mm. for me there's an issue around confidence in immuniz immunization program and by by definition there has to be confidence in it and you know mm. we've seen in the past the MMR uh, issues that were in the early days of this parliament were, were very yeah. alive and you know one might argue there have been consequences to that for certain when people have, have stepped out of the immunisation programme. Also no I don't know if you were in the petition committee in session four would you have been yeah. Angus? Mm -hmm. yeah. When this was already mm -hmm. this was discussed the sort of views of the various organisations and closed the petition down. I wonder whether you know it, it's the, the petition is entitled to bring the petition back. But if we just go back through the same process again, I'm wondering how valid that is in terms of simply organize, asking organisations to reiterate what they've said before. I don't know if you have a view on that. Well, I mean, it was it was two years ago, Convener, right. um, so it may be that, that views have changed. You know, who, who knows? Okay. Um, we would have to, to contact them to find out. Um, but, it, but the petition was closed on the basis that uh, there was no support for, for what the petitioner sought at the I time. Was, sorry, I was just seeking exactly what, what this is seeking, a, a new statutory body? Or? I don't have the exact wording of the petition in front of me, but mm. um, it was broadly along the same lines. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, my, in, in terms of recognising, um, clearly this has been an issue the Parliament's dealt with before, but we are looking for an update then. So we would write to Scottish Government seeking its view in the petition and again relevant stakeholders. Um, just to clarify, the um, previous petition was PE1584 and it was calling on the Scottish Parliament to urge the Scottish Government to set up an advisory committee within NHS Scotland to provide advice on immunisation and vaccination policy. So it's a slightly different uh, um, approach in terms of what would, would be done. There is a body here that's recognised in the rest of the UK, and it, the question is why? Why is there a, a resistance to recognising it here? I suppose mm -hmm. because I can see why they might not want to have to go through the whole motion of setting one up within. But so I suppose that's the question I'd be asking. You know, what is the what is the uh, objection to not having them as a recognised statutory body? I think it's worth asking for an update on their. Mm -hmm. Um, stance on it now. As as this has come this has come back, we should find we should find out what their thinking is. Okay. Yeah, yeah it, it seems to me that um, the petitioner Bill Welsh is asking for more than the the previous yes. petition was uh, with regard to the setting up of a uh, uh, an independent vaccine safety commission. Uh, so that does go further than the previous petition. Yeah. Okay, so it would be worth asking. Um, for, for views on that approach then. So, is that agreed? Yes. Okay, thanks very much for that. Um, I'm going to suspend briefly before the next item.
order and if we can move to agenda item three consideration of continued petitions petition 1463 by sandra white marion dyer and lorraine cleaver on effective thyroid and adrenal testing diagnosis and treatment um we'll, we'll ask us to do this petition at our meeting on the 15th of june when we took evidence from lorraine cleaver the petitioner and john midgley and can i welcome elaine smith msp for this item on the agenda we agreed at that time to reflect a future meeting on the evidence we had heard. Today's consideration gives us the opportunity to do so. We've also received further written submissions in relation to the petition, including a submission from the petitioner and a submission from Elaine Smith, MSP, who has a long-standing interest in the petition. We have previously considered the draft report, and I think it would still be our intention to publish a report on the petition. I wonder if members have any comments or suggestions and whether it would be worth maybe asking Elaine to... Um, add any uh, contributions you want to make before we go any further. Yeah, thank you very much, convener, and thanks for the opportunity to do that. Can I apologise, first of all, for Lorraine Cleaver, the petitioner. She's usually here when her petition is being considered, but she's unwell. So apologies for Lorraine. Um, yes, I put in the further submission, actually, because personally, as you all know, I have my own story, and actually I thought it was sorted, and I was fighting for other people. Um, although the desiccated thyroid hormone is a different issue, obviously. But however, we now seem to have taken a big leap backwards, unfortunately, um, with the T3 situation. So that's why I put a further submission in, which um, hopefully the committee will have had some time to, to have a read at. So um, I think it's even more... It's good the committee are obviously still considering the petition. Um, and I think that... It would, it would obviously be helpful if your report was published, whatever you were going to report on. And I think you also had agreed to seek a chamber debate, so I don't know if that's still the case. But um, no, I, th I think that was all I would like to say, that unfortunately we now seem to be going backwards. OK. Brian? Thanks, Kimi. I think that... Uh, uh, the, the, the thing, I think we've all had a, a real interest uh, in this particular uh, in particular one, and, and what, what strikes me is the amount of evidence that conflicts. Um, you know, the, the, having spoken to a, a consultant who's very much in favour, um, also then suggested that 50% are not. And I think that the idea of pulling all of our evidence together into uh, a, a report um, might give a little bit of clarity in, in how we take this forward or how the government can, would consider consider this because th there's a mountain uh, of evidence here and, and just some of it just seems to be so conflicting. Mm -hmm. So I, I would like to see it pulled together mm -hmm. into a report so we can actually make some sense of it. Okay, Rona? There was a wee point in our briefing that was mentioned to you that I was a bit confused about. Maybe Elaine could um, enlighten me. It's just about the... Um, the work that NICE is due to begin on guidelines for thyroid disease due to begin this month. But the issue of the guidelines doesn't appear in the briefing material for the first scoping meeting. So I'm a bit confused if it's about guidelines, why guidelines don't appear in the briefing material. Is that... Maybe you could... If I may, uh, uh -huh. I know Lorraine Cleaver um, went down to London and she was at the meeting on Tuesday, albeit she was actually unwell at the time. Um, and she <coughs> said it was quite a positive meeting. It did, she did try to get it widened out slightly at that event. But again, there was conflicting. Uh, you know, they had, she had endocrinologists who firmly believe the, ev the new evidence, which is there, that combination therapy is much better than T4 for many, many people. But then you also had the, the establishment, if you like, who very firmly think that T4 is the only way to treat uh, th underactive thyroids. So Lorraine was quite um, hopeful, but that was just the first meeting. Mm -hmm. But I don't think she felt that, um, that that was in any way conflicting with anything that the committee are doing and that that work would be ongoing. And mm -hmm. she will be input into that. Can I ask Elaine that the, the work that they're doing on the guidelines, do you know when it's, if it's due to start now, do you know how long that's going to take? I think it's going to probably, I don't know exactly, but my understanding from Lorraine is that there's going to be a number of meetings, so I would think it'd be into next year before they come mm -hmm. up with anything. Mm -hmm. okay. Angus? <coughs> Uh, thanks, Convener. I'm, I'm struck by uh, Elaine's comment that um, we seem to be taking a, a big leap backwards. Um, it's, it's worth noting that this petition's been ongoing since 
I think it's December 2012, uh, and it's one of our, our longest running petitions. Um, so I, I would agree with uh, uh, Brian Whittle that uh, I think we need to um, uh, take on board the, the latest information uh, and compile it into into a, a, a draft report, uh, which we should consider. Um, we should consider further action once we once we, we've had sight of that. Mm -hmm. Okay, sorry. I think. I mean, if I get remember correctly, I think there have been set twenty separate um, sessions where this petition has been considered, and it's been quite a wide range. So there's a lot of information there, and I think there's information about perhaps the division within the medical profession on how best to treat thyroid, but also some of the underlying issues around people with this condition being treated properly and their diagnosis being treated seriously. And I think Elaine has made comment in the past about um, the way in which women are treated in the process. So these are all interesting things that may be drawn from um, the draft report, because there's really a body of knowledge there which we could, at the very least, present to the Scottish Government and expect them um, to respond to. And I think we did talk in the past about a, um, a debate in Parliament, and that might be on the basis of the report itself. Um, so I think we, we do recognise there's a huge amount of work being already done. This is a, is a very is a significant issue because it's the conflict with within the profession or clinical um, issues, but also just all the complexities of access and the drugs and so on, which I think um, so I certainly have wrestled with all of the, of the detail of that. But um, I think it would be worthwhile to draw all of that evidence and information, that body of knowledge together into a draft report and. Um, you know, give that information to the government and I certainly have a debate and see what comes from that. Is that agreed? Yeah, I think somebody coming in new to this, uh, I would very much like to see it pulled together. There's a huge amount of reading here and getting your head around it and understanding the complexities of it. But I am very conscious that it has been going for a long time um, and that there are a lot of people out there right now who are struggling with this and who are really wanting some answers, wanting some decisions. Um, so I'd, I'd be quite keen to see that report quite quickly and I think taking it to debate in Parliament would be a good idea, both in terms of raising awareness but also in terms of engaging with the endocrinologists generally and, and I mean, I, they will have professional seminars etc and I'm not sure where where from a professional seminar point of view they are in their thinking. Mm. I mean, there's obviously conflict in the profession around it just from the body of evidence we have here. Um, but it seems to be a tension between the old and the new um, and, and where research is going. And, and there doesn't seem to be enough research actually underpinning the arguments around the changes, particularly around the, the hybrid, the, the mixed treatment. So I think, I think, you know, I'd like to push yeah. it along a bit quicker, yeah, I think. push it along a bit quicker. Mm. And I think the, one, uh, the thing that strikes me, and you know, not having been involved in it from the beginning, um, is that the patients' voices are not heard clearly enough and I think if we do a report um, you know to make the point that you know that there can be a dispute within the medical profession about things but at the end of the day it's the patients that are suffering the ones that um, you know that are uh, that they wouldn't be saying and, and, and asking for these things if, it, if they didn't feel it was necessary so I think the patient's voice needs to be heard a lot stronger and maybe by us bringing it to a head with a report and a debate that might that might help that matter along. Elaine, you want to add something there? It was just in terms of um, there is up-to-date research that shows that actually monotherapy isn't particularly good and that, that dual yeah, therapy so. is uh, combination therapy is better. These are the reports that haven't really been given much credence by the old guard of the, the medical establishment. But although we might say that it's, um, it's sort of younger, newer endocrinologists who may be taking more of an interest in T3, actually Dr Anthony Toft, who's an eminent um, Edinburgh endocrinologist, he now operates privately because he had to retire from the NHS, but he actually changed his mind on this issue over a period of time and he had been um, on the, the British Thyroid Association and 
he is, if, if any members are interested, I know how busy members are, but I'm chairing an event in Liberton High School next Tuesday night where Dr Anthony Toft is addressing this issue of going backwards with the situation around T3. So that, you know, it's open to anyone to, to come along to that next Tuesday evening and maybe to get some answers. But also I think it's important to stress as well in terms of patients, this is, it's over 90%, it's about 95% women. And unfortunately uh, for those women, a lot of the time their symptoms are dismissed as uh, the menopause, they're dismissed as mental health issues, they're given antidepressants. And uh, it's just also <clears throat> the issue around the, the diet pill issue that I raised. So they're probably um, advised that, well, you know, if, you, if you're overweight, then just go do exercise and lose weight. It's nothing to do with your thyroid. So that's the unfortunate part of it. I think there's been a lot of disempowered patients because of the way they feel, because of the way they're treated, and primarily because it's a massive women's issue. Mm -hmm. Okay, I mean, I should emphasise that, in fact, we did have um, a draft report being pulled together, but we paused on that in order to get the further evidence and to hear from um, Dr Midgley and to inform the new members of, of the committee. Um, I think that we've also afforded Elaine the opportunity to advertise an event next Tuesday, so public platform for that. Um, I think we, we, we are agreed that we do want um, to consider a draft report on the petition. Um, I think we'll be doing that in private at a future meeting and then and also seek a request for a, a debate in the chamber if that's agreed. 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 Okay, thanks very much and thank you, Elaine, for your attendance. If we can now move on to the next petition for consideration, which is petition 1548 on national guidance on restraint and seclusion in schools. We last considered this petition on the 11th of May. Members will recall that at that meeting we considered the draft guidance on de-escalation and physical intervention, which was provided to us by the Deputy First Minister. The clerk's note summarises our feedback on that guidance and notes that the Deputy First Minister agreed with our comments. There appears to be good progress in communication between the petitioner, the Deputy First Minister and the Scottish Government's advisory group on additional support needs. The petition refers to a recent meeting that she and Kate Sanger attended to talk about the communication passport and positive behaviour support as being very positive. She indicates that she looks forward to feedback from the meeting. The Deputy First Minister mentions that Education Scotland will be holding three national events over the autumn to raise awareness of the guidance among local authorities and schools and to support its implementation. There does, however, still seem to be a question over the most appropriate place for the guidance and there are suggestions that it might be better placed in the Holding Safety Safely document, which appears as due for review in the coming months. The petitioner adds that Professor Jennifer Davidson, who led the team that developed the document, has indicated she would be happy to discuss an update with her team. And I wonder if members have any comments or suggestions on how we progress this petition. Right. I think we made quite a lot of progress on this type of, uh, this petition. And I think, especially around uh, when, when the deputy first minister came in and, and you know I, I agreed with pretty much everything that we had to say, and I think uh, it seems that the government have taken that on, uh, and he's taken that uh, that particular uh, the issue forward. I th for us, I think the only thing we've got left uh, just now is would be to ask for progress. Uh, on that and, and whether or not that might uh, it, the most appropriate you know, place for it would be within the, the, the holding safely document uh, and whether that's under consideration. Mm -hmm. um, yep. I do think we've made a lot of progress. Angus? Thanks. Um, <clears throat> I'm certainly pleased that the petitioner is pleased mm -hmm. uh, with the, the progress uh, on this petition and I'm glad that the Deputy First Minister uh, has shown he's, he's listening um, and, uh, and taken taking action. But I would agree with uh, uh, Brian Whittle um, that um, we should seek his views further on the suggestion that holding safely might be a more appropriate place for the, the draft guidance um, and whether he would agree to, to this being considered as part of the forthcoming review of the holding safely document. Okay. I think we, I think we do recognise the progress and the willingness of the Deputy First Minister to respond to the issues that have been um, flagged up to him by the petitioner and others. Um, but are we agreed in the, the suggestion that Angus and Brian both make that we will look yeah, for that totally response? Yep. Is that agreed? Okay. In that case, we can move on to the next petition, 
which is um, Petition 1595, which calls for a moratorium on shared space schemes. Members will recall that we last considered this petition on 11th of May 2017, when we heard a report back on the shared spaces seminar that was held in April. We now have the final report of, the, of that seminar and a submission from the petitioner. The final report reaches a number of conclusions in relation to shared space, and I note the petitioner has indicated that he considers these conclusions vindicate his position and makes all the recommendations asked for in his petition. I wonder if members have any comments or suggestions for further actions. Seems reasonable now to write to the minister and ask him what he intends to do with it. I, I, I don't see that there's much more at this point that we need to do, really. Yeah. Rona, don't well, if you want to say in particular? Yes, I just to clear, to clear an interest, um, the petitioner is a, is a constituent of mine, and I've been quite involved with his campaign um, since I was elected. Um, yes, absolutely. I mean, um, he's... You know, he's been very clear in his submission about the findings of, you know, the, the most recent report, and um, I think now we need to we need to take it further and ask the minister um, his views on it, and 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 you know what what can what can now be done um, because this issue is, um, is is going to remain until something is resolved mm -hmm. with it. Certainly, in in my constituency, it's it's a huge issue and. Uh, as far as I believe the, the local authority are, are having a consultation or a study survey of the whole of the streetscape, but it's 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 taking a long time and there's no real um, commitment from the from them at the moment to to uh, restore safety crossings and, and I think I think it goes wider than just my constituency. It's it, obviously the petitioner um, is, is not happy about the uh, shared space schemes throughout throughout the UK actually mm -hmm. um, so I think we need to, we need to hear from the minister on it yeah okay is that agreed that, yeah. that, that yeah. we, we recognize the progress that's been made significant recommendations made in the, the, <clears throat> the final report of the shared spaces seminar I think an expectation from the petitioner and perhaps ourselves that, that we would want to see these implemented and so we'd be looking to um, get a response from the Minister for Transport in the islands on how he would how he does plan to respond. If that's agreed, in that case, we can move on and recognise, I think, that the, the petitioner himself does feel satisfied that there has been a purpose and, and an outcome from the petition itself. OK, um, the next petition is Petition 1600 on Speed Awareness Courses. Members will recall that a previous consideration of this petition in May we agreed to seek clarification about why progress in this issue appeared to be slow. The Scottish Government's submission indicates that the issue and the consideration of whether or not speed awareness courses should be rolled out is, quote, solely a matter for the Lord Advocate. The Scottish Government had previously advised that the Strategic Partnership Board had invited Police Scotland to provide detailed information on suggested models for the pilot and wider rollout, supported by comprehensive descriptions of its intended monitoring and evaluation for consideration at the next Strategic Partnership Board meeting, which was scheduled for this month. And I wonder if members have any comments or suggestions. I'm confused, actually, because I, um, one of my clients I uh, worked with before coming to Parliament, was sent on a course. So when I read this, I thought, well, what course was he sent on then? <laughs> so it, are the things running? Well, I, th I think from the point of view of the Public Petitions Committee, our sense was that there seemed to be an awful lot of dragging of heels and there was a lot of stuff getting referred here, there and everywhere um, in terms of what could be done. So I'm not sure whether you can access a speed awareness course, but it may be a different matter if it's as an alternative to, to some conviction for speeding. You know, so it's like pre -court, a, a form of pre-court diversion, that if you, if you do this speed awareness course, then... Well, that's what I'd understood he'd gone on, so I'm... I'm I don't know. Mm -hmm. I mean, it is, it's a sense that it is, does appear to be a sensible, but I don't know what the... I suppose we'd have to look at the evidence base and what the evidence base is in terms of the outcomes mm -hmm. of doing it and whether it reduces subsequent offending. I think it would be worth... We, we should contact Police Scotland because... Um, in the government's submission, and they make it clear it's a matter for the Lord Advocate. But he said it would, you know, he would be happy to consider any report, a detailed proposal from Police Scotland, if they put it forward to him. 
and we don't know at this stage whether they've done that. Mm -hmm. So I think we need to find out if they've done it and or if they intend to do it um, before we can really take you know take anything. I suppose the question forward. I would ask in what set of circumstances would the Lord Advocate simply look at the evidence himself and say, you know, this might work? Uh -huh. Because there seems to be this it feels to me there's this massive delay getting built into this into something that feels quite straightforward, yeah. Yeah. that it would improve outcomes, um, it would improve road safety. Mm -hmm. um, I can't see what the downside of it is, but it, there is a reluctance somewhere in the process. Now, it just may be that the process overwhelmed, the system's overwhelmed with other things. Okay. Yeah. I don't know. Okay, it could be. Yeah, um, so I think, you know, uh, Rona's suggestion that we, we write to Police Scotland would be worthwhile, but I would also suggest right to Lord Advocate themselves, himself, and just, you know, has he had the opportunity to consider a more detailed proposal? Because he referred to that in his submission in October 2016. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And just check what, what, if anything, is already being used in Scotland or anywhere in Scotland. Yeah. I know in the borders we have the young drivers courses as well, so it may be yeah. that it's a localised yeah. thing that's going on. Okay, so... <laughs> I think we said this the last time it feels as if it's a pretty straightforward thing to do but mm -hmm. for some reason it's getting terribly complicated so it'll be worth knowing why that is <laughs> Okay, in that case if we can move on to our next petition which is petition 1604 which is calling the Scottish Parliament to urge the Scottish Government to expand the remit of the review into the arrangements for investigating the deaths of patients under section 37 of the Mental Health Care and Treatment Scotland Act 2015 to include an inquest type system for all deaths by suicide in Scotland and to include both patients who were released from hospital or receiving care in the community under compulsory treatment orders. Members will recall that at our previous consideration of this, um, we agreed to write to the Minister for Mental Health asking the Scottish Government to consult a petitioner as part of its work to extend the terms of the review and for further information about the percentage of suicide reviews carried out within three months. The Scottish Government submission commits to consult the petitioner as part of the review process. It also explains that given the complex nature of suicide, there is no target for the commencement and completion of suicide reviews. Um, and I wonder if people have suggestions of how we might deal with this petition. It, it asks us to urge the Scottish Government to look at it, which it seems the committee has done and it seems the Government has taken on board. So. When I read it, I thought, well, it seems that we've done what we were asked and we've had the appropriate response. So I'm not sure whether there is a remit to go any further at this point. Mm -hmm. I, I suppose one thing I thought was it might be that um, these reviews are complex and complicated, but it doesn't necessarily mean you wouldn't have a target for it. You, know, you could yeah. accept that some of them might be more complex and be beyond that. I think the worry about not having any target round reviews is a sense, I think we got an evidence yeah. mm -hmm. that it, it goes on as long as the process mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. goes on and I think that it's a frustration for the, I mean we do, you went on the committee mm -hmm. at the time but the petitioner's evidence was very powerful and you know given it was such a personal thing to her I think it was um, mm -hmm. a very courageous um, evidence that she gave as well but the part of it was the sense in which there wasn't, I might be misrepresented, it wasn't a rigour round the process. I mean, first of all, that if you weren't um, actually in hospital, it wasn't treated the same way, and I think there's been progress in that regard, but also that um, there wasn't a ticking of time scale. And what I was trying to do was, was, was look at what the petitioner was asking for. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and, and although it did, for me, throw up other issues, Surely, what we should be considering is whether or not we've, we've managed to adhere to what the petitioner was asking for. And in, in my view, that seems to have been delivered. Mm -hmm. Can I suggest as well whether it's right or wrong? But the earlier petition we looked at around um, revisiting, in terms of the Mental Health Act, the independent reviews, in a way that would pick up some of the wider issues here. So. You know, if if we progress, the looking at how um, care and treatment is is um, looked at to the, under the Mental Health Act, then actually some of the wider issues in this petition that aren't directly the the ask of the petitioner, mm -hmm. if there was an independent review body, they would be able to appeal that. to that independent review body. So in effect, you you are 
through the other petition, you would be addressing some of the fallout issues of this one. Hmm. I think in, in terms, perhaps, of the sense from the committee that we feel the process of the petition has, has succeeded in that the issues have been highlighted, um, that the, the government has confirmed it'll extend the terms of the review to cover the issue raised by the petition, and it has committed to consult with the petition. I think these are all very positive things for the petitioner herself. And on that basis, would it be reasonable to close the petition um, in that it's achieved the intention of the petitioner? And it, of course, would be open um, to the petitioner if at some point in the future she wanted to come back and raise with the, with, uh, the committee her sense of how effective that's been. I mean, the only other thing, I mean, I, I agree with you, convener, but I think the only other thing that, you know, we could do would be to, to try and establish any sense of a time scale on, on the review, you know, for when this was actually going to, when this could come to some sort of decision, you know, um, but I, I mean, I don't know if we would, we'd be able to get that, but... Um, would it be reasonable in writing to the Scottish Government to confirm that we've we're closing the petition. Mm -hmm. We recognise the progress that's been made, but just highlight this issue I around so. mm -hmm. being um, yeah. open-ended. So we're not I, I, continuing I think the so. petition yeah. unnecessarily. Yeah, I think that might be the best plan. And mm -hmm. okay. So um, if that's agreed, we want to, we would agree to close the petition under Rule 15.7 of Standing Orders, on the basis the government has confirmed it will extend the terms of the review to cover the issues raised by the petition, and that is committed to consult the petitioner as part of that process. And I think, again, we'd want to thank um, the peti for Catherine um, Matheson and her family for yes. bringing the petition forward and recognising that there has been um, you know, a, a, an outcome from it, which I hope she'll find of some comfort. Um, if we can now move on to the next petition for consideration today, which is petition 1610, which calls on the Scottish Parliament to urge the Scottish Government to upgrade the A75 Euro route to dual carriageway for its entirety as soon as possible. Members will recall that a fact-finding visit recently took place in relation to this petition on 7th September 2017 in Dumfries and Galloway, and the committee heard from a wide range of stakeholders, including the petitioner. Members will also recall that at its meeting last week, the committee considered petition 1657, which calls for a similar upgrade to the A77. At this meeting, members agreed to invite the Cabinet Secretary for the Economy, Jobs and Fair Work to provide evidence at a future meeting. Um, I think this is now our opportunity to discuss what further action we may wish to take in relation to the petition before us today. Brian? Right, obviously, um, this is uh, work that I've been doing uh, on an ongoing basis. In fact, I've, I've just received some replies back from the Transport Minister as to <laughs> The intention uh, of, of the government over the next um, uh, over the next sort of period of time, and uh, although the the, the the indication is that the money will be spent um, on the 75 and 77, um, I think they fall short of what the petition is, is asking for. Um, I think it's very uh, uh, timorous because um, the the, the uh, bypass of the Mabel Mabel bypass on the 77 is uh, currently going out uh, for tender um, and the indication from the petitioner is that although uh, the bypass and Mabel is welcome, um, it, is, it will not be a dual carriageway um, and, and other sort of ancillary um, uh, uh, developments like cycle tracks and whatnot not um, are, are not going to be put in place. So I think, for me, I think we've got to push this forward quite quickly because I think what's going to happen will be quick. And it's to try and ensure that whatever um, the government decide to do um, is um, future-proofed, actually. It's future-proof in the development of this, because as the petition asks for, uh, is the sort of longer term overtaking opportunities in the 75 and starting to bypass and starting to put... Um, uh, but the, but the longer-term issue is around dueling the 75 and the 77. So I think we've got to ensure that um, the petitioner's desire... Uh, uh, long-term desire is, is, is in keeping with what the government are proposing to do with the, uh, the interim works with 75 and 77. Okay, any other views? Angus? <coughs> Thanks, um, convener. Um, before I discuss the petition, uh, I'd just like to place on record my thanks to uh, 
the, the good folk of Dumfries and Galloway for the welcome um, they, they gave the, the petitions committee when mm -hmm. we visited a couple of weeks ago. Um, the, the, the round table session we had in Castle Douglas was extremely useful uh, and as is the case uh, with these things could have lasted a lot longer than the, the, the time we had um, but unfortunately we had to move on to, to, to other, other meetings uh, on the day. But we certainly saw it first hand um, and took evidence on the, the uh, issues with regard to the A75 and the proximity of the road in particular to housing in Springholm and uh, Crockettford uh, and, and of course the other issues that were highlighted on the day. Um, but given that we've already agreed to invite the uh, Cabinet Secretary for Economy, Jobs and Fair Work in and whether it is him or the Transport Minister who, who, who appears, um, as Mr Whittle says, I think we you know, time's of the essence, and the sooner we do it, the better. To cut a long story short. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so it's like, yeah, I Any just other views? agree with what Angus said. Yeah, we, I agree. I think we yeah. join the two petitions yeah. together, and uh, we get the minister mm -hmm. with us and the petitioners, mm -hmm. and we move quickly. And I, I think um, Brian makes a very good point about the Mabel Bypass. You know, I mean, the frustration of watching roads being built anywhere in the UK and then five minutes later they're back having to widen them or extend them is, is just infuriating. Mm -hmm. And the money that's involved in, in doing it is, is ridiculous. The more motorway you build, the more people will come and use them. So, I, I mean, I think there's... But I don't think, I mean, w the situation with the 75 and, and the 77 is, you know, is really about, for me anyway, the, the strong evidence there was about the link to the port yeah. and the vital yeah. economic value of the port. Um, and what we, what we see is, is the shipping lines who've put in the investment on the promise of, of improvement of roads and haven't seen the improvement of the roads. And, you know, with less than well, a sort of 25-minute difference to send them south of the border, when you consider that most of the product, what, one of the things I asked was where does all the, the goods go? Are, are they coming in Scotland or are they going south? They're going south and they're choosing to use our ports to bring them in and then transport them down, down the country. It, it wouldn't take much for them to go the other way, and I think it, it is vital that we keep our ports open. And to do that, we've got to have good roads to serve mm -hmm. them. So I think this is, and and then if you lay on top of that the residents, the question of, of being able to get to hospital and all the other bits of evidence we heard, mm -hmm. I think it, it's really important that we we push this harder. I, mean, I think in in terms of um, hearing evidence, I feel quite strongly that it should be the cabinet secretary because I think it's much broader yeah. than simply a transport issue. I think there's Absolutely. environment, social, economic yeah. issues there, yeah. and it, it, these are big decisions that can be made at cabinet level. Yeah a new road this yeah. is about yeah and the consequence of not getting it right would be yeah. the economic disadvantage Massive. as well as the mm -hmm. um, social environmental disadvantage so can I I think we're agreeing that we want to bring these two petitions together we recognize a lot of the issues underpinning them are the same and that um, we would want to hear evidence from the cabinet secretary and again uh, subject to their diaries and our scheduling it would be as soon as is possible can we highlight when we're asking that that we have a specific issue with the um, scheduled build of the Mabel Bypass because I think they will presumably have done quite a lot of work already in terms of the um, civil engineering, planning, etc. So I think if, if we're going to have any impact on that, we do need to move really quite quickly and, and quite strongly in terms of highlighting that. Angus? Um, convener, before the Cabinet Secretary appears, um, I was quite struck uh, when we were down in Dumfries and Galloway. Uh, I think one of the salient points was the fact that this is a Euro route uh, and it's one of the only Euro routes that isn't dueled. Mm -hmm. um, so it would be good to get some information from SPICE in advance of the Cabinet Secretary appearing, uh, ask or identifying any other similar routes in, U in Northern Europe or the whole of Europe that aren't dual because I think uh, this might well be one of the few that uh, that hasn't received the investment that other Euro routes have. Okay. Just, just, I've actually seen the map, the Euro route map okay. um, of and and uh, of, of of all the routes, and which is quite extensive, and it's a little bit. Okay, so 
Yeah. Yeah. So a little bit. Okay, so I'd still like to see. Yeah, oh, absolutely. Uh, we can, <laughs> you not believe me. <laughs> we can get that information ahead of our meeting. Okay. <laughs> If we can now move on to our next petition, which is petition 1619, which is calling the Scottish Parliament to urge the Scottish Government to make continuous glucose monitoring sensors, such as Freestyle Libre, available under prescription to all patients with type 1 diabetes. As members will recall, this petition was also considered as part of its fact-finding visit to Dumfries and Galloway earlier this month. And I wonder if members have any comments or suggestions for further action based on the fact-finding okay. visit. I sit in the cross-party group uh, for diabetes, which uh, sat uh, on Tuesday this week, and I discovered that apparently it is now available. The government are going to make it available on the NHS, and I would certainly like one. The first thing I would like is clarification of that, because mm -hmm. um, it seems to be a very recent uh, um, uh, sort of development. So uh, I, I certainly like clarification if, if, if that's the case. Okay. When we met with the consultant, he, he I mean, the, it was clear that it is available on the NHS. The problem is that um, it is the quantity available. So the allocations for this year on the NHS are quite small. We heard that Dumfries and Galloway was only four. Um, so it's not that it's not available on the NHS. It's, it's about the, yeah. the yeah. equitable availability of it. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that... that was for me part of, of the big issue here because what we are seeing is um, a selective process and as the consultant made quite clear at the meeting we had, how does he choose four people, mm. or four children in his case, so four children that would get it out of the 12 that were there and would be suitable for it uh, and, and there's no difference in, in them in general terms but the difference it would make to their lives is enormous. Mm -hmm. it, this fundamentally transforms a child's life um, in terms of the activity they can do, in terms of the way they can partake in normal life alongside their classmates. So I, I think for me it is really about saying if, if we're really being honest about equity and fairness and all the rest of it, then actually the restriction on numbers is what we need to be exploring here. Okay. I think we also need to find out if the funding has actually been committed to the health board, and if it has, it doesn't appear to have trickled down for the for the, mm -hmm. this equipment because at Dumfries and Galway we heard that they hadn't received it, mm -hmm. and it was I think it was it was committed to for 2017-18, uh, so you know we're three quarters of the way through 2017, so mm -hmm. it'd be interesting to know where where the funding is, but it might have, you know we might have been overtaken by events, as Brian has said that's. Mm -hmm. I think it's now been agreed, uh -huh. but we need clarification. I mean, I think we we would we, um, looking for the Scottish government to provide further evidence at a, a meeting, and then the petitioners can respond to that. But I think these particular questions around um, equity of access, but also mm -hmm. if the funding has been allocated, what monitoring has been done, the uh -huh. reports are actually uh -huh. then yeah, it filtering out into yeah, the system. Yeah, yeah. Could I ask us to look at one other thing as well? Because one of the conflicting pieces of evidence was around cost. So um, we were given some, some pharmaceutical information ordering costs that suggested that a glucose monitoring um, sensor was not more expensive than the traditional um, injecting and, and um, blood sampling. So, but then when we spoke to the consultant, he suggested it was the other way around. Mm. So I think it would be quite important for this committee to understand the underpinning costs of it, because it's a no-brainer if it costs the same or less. It becomes slightly more complicated if there's a significant up cost to it, um, because that budget will have to be found. Yeah. So I think it's important we understand what the, what the cost is, um, because that will alter the conversation that we're having. But one, um, I think we would be concerned, however, the point you make earlier is there's a rationing. So that oh it's no, not that you're entitled to it. If you're entitled, you should be entitled to it. No, um, I'm not talking in terms of whether we think everybody should be entitled. I absolutely do, and I no, think everybody should have it. But the conversation we'll be having will be different about how we make that happen if there is a, a deficit in the costing. So mm -hmm. I think we need to understand whether there's a deficit in the costing mm -hmm. or I whether that's something, it's a like by like That's something like. we can... Um, mm -hmm ask the Scottish Government as well, but I think we're agreed we want to um, mm. invite the Scottish Government to provide evidence at a future meeting, and as I said, the petitioner will be able to respond to that. Mm. 
Um, and I would also like to echo the, the comments made by Angus um, and take this opportunity to express committee's thanks to everyone who participated in the fact-finding visit, both in relation to the A75, um, but also to the, the, on the question of diabetes continuous glucose monitoring sensors. I was unfortunately unable to attend, but understand it was a very informative and interesting visit. And we're grateful to all the people who gave their time to engage with the committee and hope they found it useful too. But it certainly looks as if it's been a good model for, for future activities by the, the committee. Um, with that, can we move on to the next petition, which is petition 1640 by Eileen Bryant, an action against irresponsible dog breeding. Our meeting papers include a number of submissions from stakeholders which identify areas of existing legislation that they consider could be strengthened. These include an upper limit on the number of bre breeding bitches in any establishment, breeders to be registered and licensed with a public accessible, publicly accessible list of breeders to be established, a robust microchipping process, and the need for better enforcement. The submissions also identify the need for collaborative working between all the relevant agencies or professions involved in animal health and welfare, including vets, local authorities, trading standards, SSPCA, Police Scotland breeders, and the general public. The submissions from Police Scotland and the Fries and Galloway Council refer to Operation Delphin, which members will recall will be heard about during the evidence session in May. This appears to be a good example of agencies working well together to deliver a successful scheme. The joint submission from the British Veterinary Association and British Small Animal Veterinary Association identifies an aspect that could be strengthened. It notes how findings from a survey indicated that some vets felt unable to report concerns over welfare or illegal importation of puppies through either lack of evidence or difficulties in identifying the suitable point of contact within trading standards. The Scottish Government submission identifies a range of measures it intends to take forward to strengthen animal welfare legislation. This includes updating the regulations governing the breeding and sale of dogs, reviewing the penalties available for animal welfare offences, ongoing discussions with counterparts across the UK and beyond, providing better enforcement and prosecution of offences committed, recognising the time that can be taken up with ongoing court proceedings, and an academic research study is funded into tackling the illegal trade of puppies from both a supply and demand context, which does feel like quite a substantial series of things the Scottish Government has taken on. I wonder if members have any comments or suggestions on action we might want to take. Rona? Yeah, I mean, I'm just glad that this um, this whole issue is, is, is beginning to um, gather steam and, and, you know, it's becoming... Um, much more evident that, that, that so many things do need to be done. Um, and I think um, the, the number of things that, that we've, we've talked about, about regulation, sentencing, etc., um, I think we just basically would not like to just round it all up and, and ask the government to clarify all the, the, the situations regarding timescales um, for the consultations, um, relating to ongoing court proceedings, publication of the academic research report. I think the sooner all these things are addressed, the better, because this is a, a situation that's rapidly getting out of hand, but thankfully it's now been brought to the public's attention. So um, I'm, I would ha be happy to, to recommend writing to the government just to seek updates on, on various points um, about how it plans to take, take all its commitments forward and when. Okay. Anyone else? No, I'm happy with that. No, no, I agree. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think we were all struck by the the evidence we were given at that um, at the meeting where we we heard about some of the horrible things that were going on, and it, it does feel as if the government has recognised the strength of feeling in this regard. So, in writing to them, we would really be establishing how they're going to take forward these commitments that I've already outlined. Is that agreed? Okay. And I suppose one question is whether it might actually, given the range of issues that Scottish Government has taken forward, whether it might be as easy to ask um, for the Cabinet Secretary to come to an evidence session and to provide an update. And I think there's a lot of public interest in this, so it might be a good opportunity for the, the Scottish Government to identify mm -hmm. and clarify what it's planning to do. Mm -hmm. OK. In that case, if we can move on to... 
The next petition for consideration is petition 1642, which is calling on the Scottish Parliament to urge the Scottish Government to ban the sale of caffeinated energy drinks to children under 16 years of age and to encourage the maximum use of existing powers by local authorities to restrict sale and marketing of energy drinks to children. Members will recall that at a previous consideration of this meeting, we agreed to write to Scottish Government, COSLA, the Cross-Party Group on Independent Convenience Stores, Community Food and Health Scotland, Scottish Grocers Federation, University of Strathclyde Centre for Health Policy and the Jamie Oliver Food Foundation. The Scottish Government submission states there is no plans to regulate the sale of energy drinks, recognising in instead the need to work with the industry and local authorities to improve existing arrangements. This is a view also shared both by the Scottish Grocers Federation and the Cross-Party Group on Independent Convenience Stores. In contrast, the Jamie Oliver Food Foundation fully supports the petition and believes restrictions should be imposed on children buying energy drinks, similar to that of alcohol age restrictions. NHS Health Scotland states that they would support action to restrict the marketing and promotion of energy drinks to children and young people and work with retailers to restrict the sale of caffeinated energy drinks, displaying warning notices to children and young people under 16. And I wonder if members have any comments or suggestions for further action. Right. Well, well the, um, the the government acts is just about to go to consultation on the obesity strategy. Right. The obesity strategy, but I, but I don't think that uh, it's a, I think it's a twelve week uh, consultation. Um, but I think the obesity strategy, if I'm right, won't come out until the summer of 2018. It seems quite. A, 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 I've got to say quite a long way away. Uh, and, um, you know, when we're considering that this uh, particular uh, petition. Um, I'm, I'm really interested around the uh, potential, you know, uh, restriction in marketing, and how we go about doing that. And I, would, I, I think in the interim, it, there's very, there's little point asking the government for uh, an update on the beastie strategy because they're just going to consultation. But I would really be interested, specifically, in the marketing uh, of these energy drinks uh, and the potential of, this, of, of reducing that or restricting that marketing. And I would write to the Scottish I would like to quite like to write to the Scottish Government under that quite narrow uh, mm. focus. Is there, any, is there any current restriction on marketing or, or, or even sale of them? I mean is it no. there's no, no there's none. No. And there's no marketing restrictions no. on it either. No. Okay. So it'd be interested to look at what what the capacity to do that is. Yeah. <coughs> Um, I saw something in one of the submissions that I thought was quite interesting. I think in Edinburgh, they have restricted the sale of it, these drinks within buildings over which they've got some control. So that would be schools, leisure centres yeah. and so on. And it would be quite interesting to know whether that is something the Scottish Government has looked at. Encouraging voluntary. Mm -hmm. I mean, I know sort of the encouraging of voluntary restrictions... Um, the county says to head up the drug and alcohol unit for young, young people and, and offenders and we did a lot of work around encouraging local shops etc to think about what they were putting on their shelves and who they were who their customer base was um, but I mean that does require individuals and, and when something is highly popular and it sells well particularly for smaller shops they're, they're more likely to sell it because it's it keeps their business turning over um, I I have absolute sympathy with the petitioner here, and I, I do think it's something we need to look at, and particularly where some of these energy drinks are then being mixed with alcohol. Um, they can have profound effects. So um, yeah, whilst I have sympathy with it, I, I think it'll be difficult. Um, so I think we need to, to do what's been suggested, and we need to talk in a, in a narrow remit about what might be feasible, and I think looking at the marketing element is where we need to go initially. Um, I think a ban would have to come later down the line. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure you, 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 it would be really, I think it would be really difficult. I mean, it's like trying to stop young people drinking alcohol underage, <laughs> you know, wherever you put it, mm. you know, so, so I think yeah. let's start by lowering its profile. Um, I think a, I think mm. a ban would, would be would be difficult, if mm. if not impossible, to be honest, to to even police and and, and, and exactly. to, to carry through. But in the programme for government, the commitment was made by the government to limit the marketing of of products in high high in fat and sugar and salt. But we're not sure what that commitment is. So maybe we can ask for clarification on mm. that. 
Yeah, it's also worth that. noting that this is about caffeine levels as well. So, so if if you limit sugar and salt and all those things, they can put low el elements of that in these drinks and still have the high caffeine levels. So, mm -hmm. yeah. so it's really important to be clear about what you're sense. actually what mm -hmm. you're actually restricting marketing on. Yeah. I, th I think also, uh, uh, convener, the, the 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 industry itself is starting to to consider self-regulation and start to do quite a lot of work around this mm -hmm. area as well. So I, I, would, I don't know how we do that, but I'd, quite, I'd be really interested to see where they are, because quite a lot of the time, especially the big boys, are, are, are ahead of the curve uh, in, in this, and in understanding where where the, the, the drive is going to come from in, in future. I don't so know how some we do of that, that is the, the, the voluntary engagement is ahead and to resist compulsion. Yeah. So. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I, to be honest, it's, it's about business as well. I mean, good businesses stay ahead of where the trend is going and where the market is likely to go. So if they think that the trend is going to be anti that mm -hmm. that particular product, they seek to get out the market yeah. fairly quickly and find an alternative. Yeah. So, yeah, so, yeah they want to be on the right side. I mean, that's mm -hmm. why Coca-Cola has zero Coke now. <laughs> it's, it's all about making sure you're delivering the product for the market. And so the we can influence the market the without course. banning things. We can influence the market by education and, and trend. Mm -hmm. Okay, any other comments on how we take this forward? I think um, it, I'm interested that the degree of unanimity across different organisations, with the exception of the Jamie Oliver Food Foundation, <coughs> and saying at this stage they feel that's too complicated, but recognising there is an issue there, and getting clarification from the Scottish Government on, on how they see their commitment in the programme for government fitting in with this would be useful. Anything else, Angus? No, no, happy. Mm. Okay, we're agreed on that then. Yeah. If we can uh, move on to the next petition for consideration, petition 1644, which is calling on the Scottish Parliament to urge the Scottish Government to prohibit in its future directives to visit Scotland the, fund the funding of country sports tourism involving the, involving the killing of animals. At our last meeting, we agreed to seek the views of a number of organisations, and we've re received submissions from the Scottish Government, the Scottish Tourism Alliance, and the Scottish Lands and Estates. We also have a submission from the petitioner in response to these organisations. As members will see, the responses we received from organisations were not supportive of the action called for in the petition, and I wonder if members have any comments or suggestions for f future action. Yes, thanks, convener. Um, I actually think there's a strong argument to close this petition, um, given that uh, there's no support uh, for the action called. <coughs> Excuse me, but um, that said, um, I would certainly um, thank the petitioner for taking the time and trouble to to raise the the, the issue. However, um, for me. Uh, the salient point in some of the, the feedback that we got was from uh, Scottish Land and Estates and the STA, um, who believe that it would be inappropriate for Visit Scotland uh, as the impartial body responsible for the visitor economy in Scotland to discriminate against any one section of the tourism industry by not providing funding for them. So when I see where the uh, petitioner is coming from, Although I don't agree with that, um, I think uh, I think we have no option but to close the petition, uh, given that there's no support for it. Yeah, I agree. I actually do agree with the petitioner, um, but I, I, I don't. I just don't see how we can we can take it forward, um, given that you know that there, there is such a lack of support, and I don't I don't think there will be any um, anybody doing a U-turn. But I think it's a shame because I actually do. I do actually believe it, uh, in this petition. Um, I'm happy to go forward and close it. And I think actually some of some of the the commentary um, will fall into some of the other work we're doing in terms of looking at land management, looking at the issues around the hares and the grouse and the, the wild animals. So I, I think um, I don't think we need to do anything more at this stage. Right. I don't think there's anywhere for the petition to go. Actually. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's a very narrow issue, isn't it, around funding for tourism. I wonder whether, um, as I think maybe Rona is suggesting, there is, or Michelle said, that this is something we've, well, we discussed earlier on, that question about wildlife crime and 
protection of species and the balance between the interests of um, the states and tourism and the protection of environment and um, animals and wildlife is maybe something that um, we, we can focus on through other work that we've done. But we recognise that that's some of the driver for yeah. the petition, but we feel that maybe um, the petition itself is not necessary to be continued in order for those issues still to be addressed. Would that be fair? Yeah. Sorts of legal issues if you went down that route with this petition. So I think it's. Mm -hmm. But I think I do think in, in agreement with Rona that that question about protecting wildlife and protecting environment and getting that balance right is something that is important. But certainly, I think we, I would be content to close the petition on the basis that in our earlier discussion we were recognising that is something that we're engaging with the Scottish government on. Okay. So in that case, if we're agreeing. Um, to close the petition under Rule 15.7 of standing orders on the basis that there is no support for the action called for in the petition. Is that agreed? Okay, thank you very much. Um, the final petition for consideration today is Petition 1645 by James Ward and the Review of Legal Aid in Scotland. Members will recall that we previously considered this petition in May when we agreed to write to seek the views of the Scottish Government, Scottish Legal Aid Board, the Law Society of Scotland and the Independent Strategic Review of Legal Aid. Clark's note gives an overview of the submission re submissions received from the Scottish Government, which refers to eligibility criteria for legal aid, but does not make any reference to the use of discretionary powers, which the petition particularly calls, um, which petition, the petition uh, particularly sought clarity. I wonder if members have any comments or suggestions. I guess we have to go and seek the views of all those involved. Yeah. Um, so, you know, the Law Society, um, Scottish Legal Aid Board. Um, I think it is confusing, to be honest. Legal aid is confusing, and um, I do have some issues with some of the way it's delivered, so I have some sympathy with the petitioner. Um, but, yeah, I, I think for the first instance, we need to go and ask and look at some of the evidence. Okay. Is that agreed then that we're, we're writing to uh, the Independent Review Group, the Law Society, Scotland, the Scottish Legal Aid Board? And do we want to um, go back to the Scottish Government specifically in this question about the use of discretionary powers, which they haven't responded to? Well, I think so. Yeah. I, I think so. Um, so that, was, that was what we initially asked mm -hmm. for. Okay, is that agreed? Yes, yeah, agreed. Okay. okay. Um, again, um, it's a petition that uh, highlights issues of concern and we, we can get a response from the relevant bodies on the issues raised by the petitioner. Um, we've now come to the end of our consideration of petitions. Can I thank everyone for their attendance and close the meeting?